Welcome back to Fast Market. I'm Alex Coffey alongside Sean Cruz filling in this morning for our regular co-host Kevin Hanks. Sean, let's talk some uh, overall equity markets because we still got a lot of weakness here in the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, but they both have kind of bounced back towards yesterday's lows after testing that 50-day SMA for the SPX. But I can't shy away from this Russell 2000, which is basically unchanged. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that tells you a lot about some of the, so the reason I would tie a lot of that weakness in uh, the NASDAQ, which kind of flows back in the S&P 500, just because mm -hmm. of the NASDAQ companies, the big tech names have such a high weighting in the S&P 500. Um, but I would tie it back to what we're seeing out of the 10 year. And the 10 year bouncing around in a range, you'll see some reaction, but not much. But we are butting up against a very well-defined resistance level on the upside where we just didn't see that 10-year breaking out of, and that's at, you know, 1.38%. So that is why I think right here we're at the top of the range and the market's saying, look, if we do break out of this, are we going to go run right back up to, you know, 1.45%, 1.5%? What's going to happen? If that's the case, that will hurt a lot of those growth type names. Um, so why would we be breaking out? To me, that is maybe an indication of the expectation for some economic strength here domestically, and that could be the retail sales data we got yesterday. It could be consumer sentiment stabilizing, although at low levels, but it is stabilizing. We're not in free fall anymore. Those are the things I think where you're getting some of that you know, growth, more economic activity, uh, an economic recovery pushing us up to that, the upper end of that range. And if we do break out, that will hurt a lot of those high growth tech names, which will certainly impact the NASDAQ 100, but then also because they're waiting, the S&P 500 will hurt those as well, but it will help the Russell 2000, the small caps that are a little bit more sensitive to what the expectations are for the U.S. economy in a good way. Exactly right, and of course, there's a little bit more added exposure to the interest rate complex as well, so it's all tied together. Uh, mega cap weakness today, though, undoubtedly is dragging on the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. And speaking of the mega caps, let's welcome in our guest, the co-founder of likefolio.com, Andy Swan, is with us to talk. Uh, you know, I think many uh, people's maybe top of the watch list when it comes to equities is, is Apple. And that's what we're focusing in on here. Uh, and for good reason, we're post the Apple product announcement, which I know at the, uh, your guys' team at Likefolio, this is one of your, your favorite events of the year to try to get a, an idea of where this company may go from here. So uh, I'll give you the floor, Andy, set us up here. What are we looking at post this event? Yeah, we really love to look at this event because the consumer reaction to the Apple keynotes historically has given us a really good indication as to how the next two to three quarters of Apple revenues will go because people react to these product announcements and then somewhere in their upgrade cycle over the next three months, six months, nine months, they actually decide whether or not to upgrade to the new phone and so on. So we've seen that really uh, tie in really well it, historically. And so uh, this year's a little different. Of course, everything's a, a little different this year because we're comparing to 2020 where Apple actually broke things up into two events. They had kind of their, their normal keynote event, I think in September and then October, they had a, a dedicated iPhone event. Whereas this year was much more the normal keynote event where they kind of did it all. And so when we compare to those levels, uh, you know, really, uh, we're seeing a really muted reaction out of the Apple community, uh, especially uh, when compared to that iPhone uh, announcement last year. And I think that's a fair comparison because they announced iPhone uh, 13 this year. And so it's really uh, down compared to last year in ter terms of consumer reaction. This, uh, was, this product announcement was really met with a collective yawn. Um, you know, consumer demand for the iPhone 13, uh, we're seeing 34% lower. Uh, than last year's uh, iPhone event. Uh, the Apple Watch, really disappointing levels of consumer reaction to that. And consumers were really hoping to see something on AirPods and they didn't get that. And so that was extraordinarily disappointing uh, for consumers of Apple. I'd say the one highlight that we saw was the reaction to the iPad. Uh, you know, consumer happiness during the event itself uh, soared plus 14 points. Uh, which is pretty much unheard of. So it tells us that people really liked what they saw uh, out of the iPad uh, improvements and innovations. And I think uh, that'll be something that uh, we continue to watch as we move forward. But overall, this event 
Uh, you know, when you compare it to last year down, and then when you compare it to just what it used to be with Steve Jobs on stage and, and where it was, even as, as uh, recent as 2018, 2019, the enthusiasm around this event just uh, really isn't there. I think it's partly because Apple's transitioning from a service, uh, from a product company to a services company, but also it's just you know tough to replicate what what Steve Jobs was and what he meant to this company. I, I, you, you segued uh, wonderfully into what I was going to ask you, Andy, and that was: Is there something here where Apple has? It made such an effort over years past to transition not from being viewed as what's the next best uh, iPhone feature or anything coming out to also having a good services blend and was there any way to measure where they were hoping for something more from services um, that maybe they didn't get or is it you know 5G there's just not I have a 5G phone I still don't really get the difference um, what do you uh, what do you do you think maybe some of the things away from the hardware was that it, in maybe uh, consumers just didn't get out of this? Yeah, I just I really just think that the focus of Apple itself and their c customer has really shifted away from uh, the hardware and more to the service. And like you're saying, Sean, you know, it, the, the value of a 5G phone is that it can receive 5G signal, right? But you have to be getting a really great 5G signal for that to even matter. Uh, and so that's out of Apple's hands now. The one bright spot I would say is that, you know, over the course, other than the iPad, over the course of time, uh, you know, we're really seeing Apple do a very good job of what we call stealing market share uh, from Google, from Android. We see uh, people talking about switching to Apple devices plus 8% versus 2019, whereas switching to Android down 38% versus 2019. So I think that whole services ecosystem you know the addictiveness of the mm -hmm. of the messaging platform and the fact that you got green bubbles on when people are with <laughs> Android and it annoys everybody. I think that's effective and it's working. And so Apple doesn't have to have the latest greatest product. They can really uh, focus more on on what they're providing uh, once the product's in people's hands. Andy, I think this is a really great point. And of course, I think we should we should always add the caveat uh, as you, you as you uh, do. Uh, your data is watching English speaking tweets. So you're primarily capturing the the North American market, which we do know Apple dominates in terms of market share, as they do not necessarily in the Asian marketplace. But you know, with what's been going on with the regulatory stuff there, I think that uh, you know, in this particular time, I think uh, Apple will be happy with their uh, dominance here domestically. As I don't know how many companies are, are looking to jump over to the Chinese markets right now. Uh, my question for you, though, is trying to get to why, because we know now that Apple they got a, a really, really strong you know foothold within the consumer base here in the U.S. I argue that the iPhone is a consumer staple product at this point, as it's one of the most important things. Uh, that and, and really any smartphone, but we know that the iPhone dominates here. So they don't necessarily need to sell you on the new iPhone now. You're going to get it when yours doesn't work anymore. But before you wanted to get the new iPhone, because there was seriously an upgrade. Like, and I don't mean to discount the the tr uh, tremendous technical technological upgrades that they make from phone to phone. But we're going from like 95 to like 95 and a half now. I can't tell how much better the camera is with my eyes. They're just not that good. And when I'm talking about the speed, the internet works now on my phone. Do I need 5G? Right, you, you know, you nailed it. Um, you know, the, the innovation leaps that we were used to seeing, you know, really just aren't there. And it may be a while before uh, there's capability of having them or you know some sort of consumer demand I, I don't even know what you should what they should invent next you know it's kind of uh, one of those things you get this like you said you get the camera and I don't know how I, I don't even know when the third lens is being used I've got this subscription <laughs> where Apple's gonna send me the new phone every year I think and I don't even know that I necessarily even want them to send me the 13 because I I just don't even know the difference and I think I'm probably like a lot of consumers. Like Folio Data says that I'm like a lot of consumers. Uh, the memes that were going around, around iPhone 13 being extraordinarily similar to iPhone 12 were hilarious. And so I think, you know, the, the, the importance of this event, unfortunately for companies like us who track it on such a close basis, is just declining uh, in terms of, of how well it will 
uh, be predictive of, of what Apple does because Apple just does so much more uh, than they used to. And it's not, like you said, it's just not about getting people super excited to run and wrap around the block for the new iPhone. It's more about what we're doing for them and how we're getting money out of them once they have the devices in their hand. And I think that's an interesting uh, thing to bring up is just getting the money out of them once you have the devices in their hands. But let's just talk about getting the devices into their hands. And that is, you know, if we're not getting as excited about it, is, does that affect promotional um, activities? You know, maybe willingness to buy is a good indicator of that. You see willingness to buy start dropping off, then maybe you have to come out get into more promotional type activities, whether it be Verizon saying, you know, free new phone or whatever. But how would, does that, do you see that impacting, say, the, the price, the per unit price? Because that is something that people um, always try and gauge every quarter is, uh, what is the average selling price for these phones? Yeah, I think that has to, that has to compress, that has to come down. The margin on, the, on these has to come down because mm -hmm. the margin isn't as important to Apple anymore. And the features aren't as important to the consumer. I do think that some pin action off of this, you know, just the fact that now the iPhone, uh, the new iPhone is not the shiny must have thing that you're gonna literally camp out for, could actually be impactful to some of the, uh, to some of the carriers and to some of the telecom companies that really counted on that, bringing new subscribers, new um, customers into their doors. Um, so I think it's probably more impactful uh, for them than it is uh, for Apple, which is you know kind of odd to say, but Apple has such a stranglehold on on the uh, entire consumer base. And while these telecoms fight each other for each and every client, um, you know it's really Apple's uh, kind of world right now, and everyone else is just trying to figure it out. In many ways, I feel weird even doing this, but uh, I'm going to paint Apple as a victim of their own success in many ways because it used to be you drop the iPhone, it shatters the screen, now you had to go get a new one because, you know, repairing the screen, just sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but now the phones are pretty good. They last a long time. The battery life's good. They have tons of memory. I think I heard they're going to have like a terabyte of memory, which I don't even know how much that is, <laughs> but I don't think I need that much. So you look at where they're making their technological leaps now. It just doesn't, it's kind of on the fringe now of, of where that's going to excite people. And it's not to discount them because they're tremendous what they're doing. It's just the everyday consumer doesn't necessarily need it. And I think that's important because we have them for longer now. We don't upgrade them as much. It's not going to be as crucial uh, of a, or I guess consistent of a revenue stream as it once was. That being said, Andy, as you pointed to, uh, this is being a little bit more lackluster compared to historical events. For those who are looking for this and pointing to it on the analyst front or the investor front saying, hey, this iPhone event's there, it's going to be great, it's always great, this is where I get my upside, we're not seeing it here. And is it almost more now that we have to see it from other products like the iPad, like the AirPods? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I think that anyone that's building in to their investment thesis in Apple, a, you know, really strong, robust, excited uh, sales volume of the iPhone 13 uh, probably should rethink that. I think that's valuable data to have. Now, the pre-orders start today. Uh, and so we'll start watching that. Uh, you know, mentions of that can be very uh, can be very correlated to revenue. So we'll watch that as well over time. But uh, you know, back to your question, yes, it's about the ecosystem that they're developing in services and payments uh, and accessories. Mm -hmm. They're doing a very good job of that. And you know, I don't want to get too down on you know iPhone innovation because, we could have been saying the same thing, and we probably were saying the same thing about BlackBerry up until 2007, 2008, when Apple came along and really did make this huge leap. And so I think the fact that they're in the game, they're continuing to try to innovate, even though it's on the fringes, is still very important for this company because they don't want to get sideswiped by, uh, you know, blindsided by, by another competitor like they did to the Blackberries and the Motorola's of the world. So uh, I do think that there's pr the probability of a huge innovation leap of the thing that you carry in your pocket is there within the next mm -hmm. three to five years. It's just, we're not seeing it yet. We don't know what it will be yet, but we do know that Apple's history of execution puts them in a top spot to be the one 
uh, that benefits the most when it does occur. And Andy, there, as you've said many times, there's better companies to bet against. I don't know how many times I read that Apple no longer innovates and look at its performance over the past few years. So it might be innovating differently, but it's still innovating and it's been incredible uh, to watch this company become uh, the behemoth that it is. Andy Swan, the co-founder of LikeFolio.com. Thanks as always. Have a great weekend. We'll catch up next week.